The third category is what's called an embossed fibre. And basically these are really good in terms of beam performance. They're easy to mix and they're also easier to finish. And the reason they're easier to finish is because they are flatter. They don't have as much spring in the actual design. So with some of the other tool fibres, you press them down with a power flow and they spring up. These tend to stay flat in the concrete. And I think we've done quite a lot of work with Bard and all over the country. And I think from the comparison, this is the best fibre with regards to mixing and finishing. If I'm wrong, you can tell me, but that's the feedback I've had. Also, dosing. If it's a small job, you can dose it by hand because it's easier to move a four kilogram dose of plastic fibres than to 25 kilogram dose of steel fibres. But on some large contracts uh, we've been involved in, we've provided different types of dosing equipment. The one on the right, uh, you can see the white material in the hopper. That's the Juris. So the one at the top right, that's been blown in on site. And that was actually uh, for the job I discussed earlier, on the car, multi-storey car park. Barden supplied the concrete and the contractor wanted to add the fibre on site because he got the equipment to do it. The one on the bottom left, that's on a job in a precast company called Give Elementus in Denmark. They do precast walls. I'll show you a brief case history later. And they basically took the fibres into that dosing machine and had five kilograms of that per cubic metre. Used that to replace two layers of A142 type mesh. And the elements are quite big, which you'll see in the picture. You can see we also supply the fibres in small boxes or, or paper bags, but we also can do them in large one ton or half a ton bulk sacks. This depends on the type of application and the end use. The information from which everything's based for concrete floor slabs is the same as when you're doing normal concrete, flexural strength. Polypropylene and steel fibres do not increase the flexural strength with normal dosages. If you go to very high dosages with special concretes, you can increase the flexural strength substantially. But for the majority of jobs, when you're replacing one or two layers of mesh, you need a dosage typically between <coughs> four and six kilograms per cubic metre. The basic premise behind this is you've got a beam that's probably five or six hundred millimetres long, 150 millimetres square. You crush the beam, and up to a certain load you get your first crack. So every concrete, a plain concrete, will crack and fall into two separate pieces. The more fibres you put in, you get what's called residual flexural strength. So that might be eight kilos, six kilos and four kilograms. So the more fibres you put in, the higher the residual energy absorption or flexural strength of that particular concrete. These are actual beam tests that were crushed at uh, Greenwich University. C30 concrete, first crack at 25 kilonewtons just over, 27 and a half. Concrete beams fall into two separate pieces uh, and if that were a floor slab it would become unserviceable. This is with six kilograms of a product that we use to supply, we don't any longer. Uh, Juris S100. This has got six kilograms. Same sort of first crack, but you can see it's got some load carrying capacity. So in this particular instance, it would still be serviceable. So you've got your crack, but the fibres hold the crack together, keep it serviceable, in much the same way as steel mesh would do. Another area of use of macro fibres is shotcrete. In shotcrete, I know you're not particularly, or you might not be interested in shotcrete, I'm not sure. But in shotcrete, they have about five, seven hundred and a thousand joules of energy absorption. And again, it's interesting to know, the more fibres you put in, the more energy absorption you can have. The two types of tests are an f naught plate test on the left, uh, and a round panel test, which is based on an ASTM test. There's various modifications of these two tests, depending on which country you go to. The premise is that you support it on the outside and you load it centrally. The values you get are what's called toughness values. So it doesn't mean you're a football hooligan from Plymouth because you've got a toughness index of 10. It means that your concrete can withstand a lot of energy or sudden rock movements. A lot of these are done in mines and tunnels where they're drilling a hole through the concrete and they want to stabilise the ground before they put the uh, precast rings in place. So they'll shock create it 
and they want to be able to stabilise that so it's a safe working environment. Just to give you an idea of that test, this is something I got from uh, uh, when we were doing a job in Spain because I wanted to know what the relevance was of a small circular panel compared to a, what they actually do in practice. And it's quite interesting to know that with a dosage of, this, has got, the, this was based on a dosage of 5 kilograms of a product called Juris S300. Round determinate panel test, 40 millimetres thick, is equivalent to a 16 millimetre crack width at the bottom of the panel. Alternatively, in practice, if you've got a 213 millimetre ground movement in the middle of a 4x4 metre drive, so basically that particular dosage, given an energy absorption of 700 joules on that test, could withstand a, rock gr a ground movement at 213 millimetres. So it's quite a big, big movement in the ground. So I always wondered why they used it, so, so now I know. Areas where we can use fibres, ground bearing slabs, Ian touched on that, can replace mesh, it's got to be ground bearing. As a company we will not support the use of our macro fibres in piled ground. Anything that's unsupported or anything where you've got to span big, big gaps, macro fibres will not work. Some people say, well, they can do that, but we, we won't say that. Multi-storey car parks, I touched on one earlier. Basically, ground-supported slab on a deck, you can use the fibres. Precast walls, roads, hard standings, I showed earlier, sea defence projects. And these are some of the jobs that have been done as combinations. So this was 27,000 cubic metres of concrete, CTRL, slab track. They use a macro fibre to replace mesh. You can see the guys there, they've got... Uh, the hats on. I think they were all Sikhs actually on this particular job. Saved them two months in the programming time to use the macro fibres rather than the steel mesh. The precast walls, they've also got the micro fibres in it. So the whole of CTRL had combinations of mesh removed, replaced by combinations of macro fibres with micro fibres, and also where needed, steel fibres. This is the Blackpool Sea Defence. As I said earlier, macro and micro fibres. This is a big IKEA superstore near Manchester. That was the first slab in the country. I think they were about 25... How many square metres were that, David? IKEA. It was a big job, weren't it? No, it was in the store, it was about uh, 56,000 square metres. 56,000 square metres, and that had a combination of steel fibres and macro fibres. And the reason for that is the company uh, who did the designs or helped with the designs were a German company and they, we, we work closely with them. They provide steel fibres as well. And they'd actually done some testing that showed the beams on this particular job were better or they could get better performance by a combination of steel and, micro fi and macro fibres. The other end of the country near London is Strood. This was the first tunnel in the UK. It was 2004 it started. Nearly 10,000 cubic metres uh, of concrete. 2,000 cubic metres of shotcrete. That was the first job in the UK. We did that in conjunction with the BASF. They had admixtures. And that was the first job in the UK to use a macro fibre for this particular purpose. So 2,000 cubic shotcrete and about... I think it was 8,000 cubic metres in situ cast concrete behind a moving shutter. And people always talk about, can you pump the concrete? Well, that were pumped sometimes a quarter of a mile. So you can pump it, provided you've got your right admixture combination and concrete. And then there are areas where you can use the fibres that I said you get a bad finish on. The tape type fibres. That's called the Danish PSTs. That's where they keep all the pig waste. For the majority of the year, that's covered with probably three metres of pig poo. So you're not bothered what the f concrete looks like or the fibre. So on those particular applications, they cast circular tanks with about 120 cube of concrete and they don't put one joint in it. They're all circular and as a company, we thought that it'd be full of cracks. And we've been going back there every year. They continue doing these and for some reason there's not one crack in them. 
must be autogenous healing caused by pig poo probably. But uh, they're the sort of jobs you can do. I've given you a brief overview. One thing I would say is that everybody, you do one job, you say that's brilliant. It's good, it's easy to get blase. As a company, we're very, very professional. If we don't think we can do a job, we'll tell you. And we'll say, well, thanks for the lead, but we're not going to do that because we don't think we can do it. We also work with a design engineer who works independently to us. And it's key that he gets the right information from the customers and the ready mix company. And he's going to do a presentation after this, after we've had a brief coffee. He's going to tell you why it's important to get that right information because without the right information, it's easy to have a problem. And then when you get a problem, the fibres get blamed or the concrete company gets blamed. And then there's chances are that you'll say, I'm never going to use that again. It's probably nothing to do with the concrete or the fibres. It's the information going in there to start with. So that's the end of my presentation. If you want to get a, a coffee or a drink or another pie, uh, if you want to ask any questions, I think we're free. We've got about three quarters of an hour at the end, something like that. So you can ask anything you like. Thanks very much for your time.